Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Roll it, Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, my first guest today and I go back a long time with a historical career spanning over three decades. This lady harbors the honor of starring in the most historical period and civil rights roles of any 90s child actor. She has had the fortune of performing in a wide range of high quality projects from film and television. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome actress, producer, writer, Raven Kelly. Hi, Raven Kelly. Glad to have you, my dear. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Great day today. As you know, we celebrate Juneteenth today and having yes, you as a guest. Too. So, you know, that's double good, double good. That, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thank and you. everyone out there, happy Juneteenth, happy Freedom Day for yes, all of yes. us. Yes, indeed, indeed. So, before we go any further, tell people, where were you born? Uh, yes, actually, I was born in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, I'm a native of uh, of the D.C., Northern Virginia area, and grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and the San Fernando Valley in California. So I consider myself a Valley Belle, part Valley Girl from L.A., and part Southern Belle from Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm a Valley Belle. <laughs> Had to get that out. Yes. Okay. Had you sang professionally prior to taking the role? Absolutely mm-hmm. not, Mr. Ron. Get and that. it was such a trip. Yes, because when uh when I got the role, you know, they auditioned, they had a huge cattle call. I mean, they auditioned little girls from all across the country, even overseas, because at the time Miss Tina didn't even live in um Zurich where she um passed away. She actually lived in Germany at the time. And they even auditioned little black girls in Germany, um, in in London, in New York, LA, everywhere. And um I sent in an audition tape from New York. And um, I was so nervous. I was like shaking like a leaf. Like that was my first time singing. And it was such a blessing to be able to meet her and, you know, just her energy, her positivity, her refinement. And I got to also meet one of my godmothers on the set of What's Love Got to Do With It, um, the musical contractor and vocal extraordinaire, Billy Barnum Crotty. Um, My godmother, she actually hired all the choir singers for the movie. And she's singing in the first row. When you look at that last clip, she's in the front row in a blue dress all the way over to the left. And my godmother, Billy and Tina Turner, they were the ones that taught me how to sing. That was my first time, you know? So yeah, that was a beautiful experience. Did you ever meet Tina Turner? Or, and if so, what was your experience like? Oh, yes. Yeah. Several times I met her over the years. Um, the first time I met her was um, during press for the movie for What's So Got to Do With It. And I met her backstage uh-huh. at her concert. And I knew about her music because my parents have brought me up to be very, you know, uh, um, you know, cultured as far as knowing my music, um, especially African-American musical appreciation. Um, but I didn't understand the magnitude of what an icon she was. You know, I just thought she was just a regular famous superstar singer. I didn't understand that she was actually a living legend that I was portraying. And I met her backstage and she played dress up with me. I remember she and I singing together and we danced with her backup dancers she let me try on her shoes and play dress up and dazzle you know a lot of people think of Tina Turner and they see this you know larger than life wild rock and roll you know and and she she was now don't get me wrong obviously you you know her as the queen of rock and roll but she had a sweet she had a sweet side to her as well and she was very endearing with me and um I just remember her just being very jovial and silly with me backstage, playing, playing dress up and dazzle, letting me try on her high stilettos. And she said, baby, you see those heels over there? And I said, yes, ma'am. She says, Raven, my love. She, that's what she used to call me, Raven, my love. Raven, my love. I'm going, to trans, I'm, I'm going to transform now into Tina Turner. I said, okay, yes, ma'am. So, And I just watched her become this 
you know, extra character and she was just fabulous, you know. Um, but I, I would see her at different events over the years, different Grammy and Oscars parties, you know, at Elton John's party. And she was always the same. She always reminded me, you know, Raven, never let anyone blow out your light. You know, she was very big about that and never let anyone abuse you as well. So that's something that I want to state on your show today. Thank you so much, by the way, for having me on, Mr. Ron. Um, and I just want to share with your viewers a message that Ms. Tina would want for me to share um, with anyone that's suffering from domestic violence. Um, there's the National Domestic Violence Prevention Hotline, and their phone number is 1-800-799-7233. Again, that's 1-800-799-7233. And if you are dealing with that or you know a loved one that's going through that, make sure that you be an advocate for your own safety or for your loved one's safety, because that's what Ms. Tina would want. Amen. If you had to describe Tina Turner in a word, what would that be? Resilience. Resilience. I mean, just the embodiment of female empowerment that she was um, and that she still is. Her spirit is still with us even now. And I think about how, you know, what she went through, even with her turbulent relationship and the abuse with Ike Turner, overcoming even at, at an early age in her childhood, the domestic violence at home that she went through and her finding her voice and you know, even finding her own sound and her new uh, renaissance at, in the second half of her life, you know, and the love of her life, Mr. Irwin, you know, my heart goes out to him. My deepest condolences to her, to her sons and to Mr. Irwin on the passing of Miss Tina. I was a wreck for the first four days when I found out I was inconsolable um, just because I just, you know, I, I remember all the great times I shared with her personally. Yes. So, but she was such a beautiful woman, a lovely spirit. Wow. And I just came back from uh, Los Angeles at her uh, premiere of her Broadway musical. Oh. I walked the red carpet there and was honored to spend, spend time backstage with uh, Naomi Rogers, who did a phenomenal job portraying her <laughs> oh. on stage. And little cutie pie, Ava Johnson, played my role. She played little Tina Turner yes. on 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 the stage and she was fabulous you should have seen her her reaction when she saw me she just got all emotional she would nearly bro broken a tear she's like mommy it's really her i can't believe it and it was a cute moment i said all we're missing is angela bassett that's all we're missing now because right. we had uh, naomi and ava and myself so it was beautiful it was a great time and my auntie don lewis was there and um we had um glenn turman my uncle glenn turman was there james pickens jr um, Vanessa Perfect. Williams, uh, Grandma Marla Gibbs, my other adopted grandma, Jima. Um, so, and she was celebrating her birthday last week. So, happy birthday, Jima, Marla Gibbs. She's 92 years young. 92 years old. Wow. <laughs> and also, another birthday um, a couple of days ago was my grandpa Bill's birthday, Bill Cobbs, the legendary yeah. grandpa Bill Cobbs of mine, yes, who played okay. um, uh, Whitney Houston's dad in The Bodyguard. He was my grandfather on my first TV series, I'll Fly Away. Got you. We got a picture of Tina. Tony, can you put that up? Oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> there she is. Yes, that's from the musical right there. I believe that's Naomi on stage on Broadway. Yeah. Yes. That's a fabulous shot. Okay. Now, you've had the honor of being the godfather of the late Yolanda King, first king of Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. Um, I was blessed to have two wonderful godmothers, um, both of them now um, sadly in heaven. Um, my, as I mentioned, my phenomenal godmother, Billy Barnum, who requested to be my godmother on the set of What's Love Got to Do With It. Um, mm -hmm. And many of you know her wonderful brother, my uncle HB. He's a musical arranger for Aretha Franklin for several decades and worked with the Beatles and Pink Floyd and um, you name it, uh, Mick Jagger. Um, so my uncle HB, um, his sister, um, my wonderful godmother, uh, Billy Barnum, passed away this past February. And my other godmother was Yolanda King. And she's the oldest child of civil rights leader and icon, Dr. Co uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, people don't know this a lot of times, but actually Auntie Yolanda and I starred in three projects together. And in one of the civil rights pieces I did, uh, uh, The Ghost of Mississippi, where Whoopi Goldberg plays my mom and James uh -huh. Pickens Jr who is the chief on Grey's Anatomy. He played Medgar Evers. He played my dad in that. 
I played Rena Evers. I played the okay. daughter to Medgar Evers in the movie. And then when my character What's it like broke, playing uh, roles like that. Oh, it's it's an honor. It's an mm -hmm. honor. And actually, um, it, it was really deep for us emotionally as actors on set because we actually filmed in the real house where Megra Evers was shot. We filmed on the actual property, the original bullet hole that entered the house after shooting him in the back from the, from the uh, Ku Klux Klan. The bullet that came in, we still had the original refrigerator in the kitchen that had the dent from the bullet on it. Um, and so just to be there and the reverence and the respect of what he represented and what Miss Murley and, and Mr. Medgar went through with their children, um, just so much respect for that. And, um, and it was, it was a beautiful, it was, it was a beautiful time for me to be a part of that and work with director Rob Reiner, who is stellar. And, um, you know, and Auntie Yolanda in, in that movie, Yolanda King, she actually uh -huh. portrayed older Rena Evers. We were the same character. She played the older one, and I was the younger one in that. So, yeah. Now, you also currently the adopted granddaughter of TV icon Marla Gibbs. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I had two adopted grandmas. Um, yes. One yes. passed away, my grandma Cicely Tyson. Love you, mm -hmm. uh, Grandma Cicely in heaven. Did you but, see yes, what she had in her so, hand? Did you see what I'm she so had blessed. Her? Yes, I see what she had in her hand. Yes. That is my queen right thank there. You, thank That's you. the queen of it all. Yes. And I'm so honored to say G Ma Marla Gibbs and I, we actually have some Christmas movies that we're going to be filming together later on this year. Yes. So we definitely want everyone to, uh, to look out for them. Uh, we have two Christmas movies called Christmas Kennel and United Christmas. We'll be filming them later on this year in the New England area. And uh, Christmas Kennel is a wonderful story about a little boy and his dog at Christmas time. And he's got his parents. It's a beautiful uh, Black holiday film family film about um, a boy and his dog. And then we also have United Christmas. And United Christmas is about bringing in all the different diverse aspects of the holidays. We're celebrating Kwanzaa, Mr. Ron. We're celebrating Christmas, Feliz Navidad, and Hanukkah all together. And so um, in that piece, we're going to have Tatiana Ali, and she has uh, an interracial love romance um, with a Jewish guy. My character is married to a Latino, and we own a Mexican restaurant. And uh, Gma is playing our grandmother in that project as well. Oh. And we also have a wonderful cast. Grandpa Bill's going to be in it too. And um, Gary Leroy Gray, who played young Tiger Woods in the Tiger Woods story from The Cosby Show, he's going to be in it. Ashley Monique Clark, um, who played uh, D.L. Hughley's daughter on The Hughley Show. She's going to be in the, in the project as well. So we're very blessed with a beautiful cast. And that cast is fabulous because we need more projects like this because yeah. the, the, the cast is going to have a lot of diversity. We have straight couples. We have a lesbian couple in the piece. Uh, the, we, ha we have a pageant going on, and the director of the pageant is a part of the LGBTQ plus mu movement. And so we're just celebrating all of the diversity that we have. We have Russian cast members in that, Asian, Black. And it's a, truly a representation of the beautiful mosaic and melting pot that it is America. So We got a couple yep. of photos for you. The first one is the film veteran Bill Cobbs. There he is. Yes, there yes. he is. Yes. He Billy. walked me down the aisle at my wedding. Yes, all he did. All right, all right. The next one was Billy yes. Barnum. You mentioned her name several times. Yes, um, that's, that's my godmother. Yes, yes. yes. The the see. wonderful vocal diva. She mm -hmm. was such a, a, a true light and an icon, my godmother. Um, Society of Singers honored her um, with a wonderful Lifetime Achievement Award. She is sang with Frank and Nancy Sinatra, Pink Floyd, um, the Beach Boys, I mean, you name it, um, Ashford and Simpson, and actually her and my godfather, she and her husband, they met singing backup for Nat King Cole back in the day. You know. so, yeah. mm -hmm. So if you're ever watching any black and white footage of Nat King Cole singing and you see one backup singer who's a white guy, that's my yeah. godfather. That was um, godmother's husband, Patrick yeah. Crotty. Mm -hmm. We got just a couple of minutes left. One person that you and I know very well, H.B. Barnum. Yes, Uncle H. 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 Yes, yes, he is. I love you, Uncle H. Yes, now he's an icon there. I mean, being Aretha Franklin's a musical arranger and conductor for over 25 years. I mean, from the Beatles to, I mean, working with Lou Rawls. I mean, just the list goes on. Gladys Knight, you know. 
uh, Uncle H is an icon. And I actually sang with Life Choir. I grew up in Life Choir singing as a little girl. You know that, Mr. Ron. Yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> always seeing you. I always miss seeing you at the different events. You you and your trademark silver dollars. Oh, always yes. giving us silver Next dollars. I, I love see you. I have one for you. Stuff. Indeed. Yes. What so before are you... we go, I definitely want to make sure that everyone um, checks out these Christmas movies that we have coming out. Um, we also have a television series, Fly, that I created. is inspired by the first all-Black female flight crew. Okay. And that's going to star Tatiana Ali and myself. And uh, we have that series coming out, and it's going to be produced by Buffalo 8 Productions. And Buffalo 8, they produced um, the Jeffrey Dahmer um, documentary that was on mm -hmm. recently uh, on Netflix and also Clerks 3. They've done several films with Bruce Willis and um, Robert De Niro. They are going to be producing both of our Christmas movies and Fly as well. So we're very, very excited about that partnership with them as well, with Matt Helderman. Okay. And this is and th these are the only projects that you're doing right coming right now? Yes, those are coming up now. Yes, they are. Excellent. And um, and before we leave, I just want to give a, a nice little Please. song in honor of Miss Tina before we go. <clears throat> There's something on my mind. Won't somebody please, please tell me what's wrong? You're just a fool. You know you're in love. What you say? Hey, 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 and sometimes you sad one more time. You know you love him, but you can't stand why he treats you like he do, and he's such a good man. Hey, 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 hey. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. It's good to thank see you again. Happy. Keep your career, as we say, keep on trucking and give my best to your family. And of course, yes, your publicist, you, Cynthia sir. Busby. Yes, wonderful publicist. My auntie, yes. Cynthia Busby, Busby Promotions at AOL.com. That's how you can reach me. Indeed. Bless you. Keep on doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Raven Kelly. Indeed. Indeed. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. We'd like to let you know that we are asking our people to help us get former baseball player Kurt Flood into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, Kurt passed away January 20th, 1997 as the husband of one of our wonderful guests, renowned actress Judy Pace. So all you got to do is contact our office at 213-349-3941. That's 213-349-3941. We sincerely thank each and every one of you for being a part of this magnificent award for a great baseball player. Roller Tony, now, one of the things I want to talk to folks about is, got to take a hot second. Do you want to get into broadcasting? Does anyone that you know, want, including yourself, want to get into broadcasting? Uh, it's a very important question that I have to ask. Every th ever thought about getting into it? You know the money is good. You meet a lot of people, go to a different place. It's a star. It's a great place to be in, a great skill to be into. I've been in it for now over 40 years. I love it. I love it. Wouldn't have it no other way. I want to tell you that I teach a class at Santa Monica College. I've been there for over 20 years, and we offer you the skills of broadcasting, announcing, and production. So like I said, ladies and gentlemen, how do you get there? How do you get that voice that the Lord gave you? How do you train? Call me at 323-533-1036, 323-533-1036. Thank you. Roller Tony. Now, I appreciate what you did for me taking this DUI, but please, come on, enough. So, you appreciate me keeping you out of jail? Yes, I do. But considering the shit you're putting me through, I'm thinking jail's not such a bad option. Oh, I'm out of here. Come on, fight, Jake! Ladies and gentlemen, they call my next guest today the actor's actor. This gentleman thoroughly enjoys being on a stage. Now, for the past 25 years, he's acted in over 100 plays, television, and film projects. His presence and passion permeates through every character he portrays. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome actor, producer, Tom Altham. Tom, hey. and welcome to the top, Actor's Choice. It's a pleasure having you today. But before oh we begin, God. please Thank tell us much. where you're from, sir. Uh, originally born in uh, New York. New Did you say New York? Yes, sir. Queens. Look at that picture right there. Look at that picture. I found that one. I knew you were going to be there. I'm homesick. I'll be there. In a month, as soon as in my book. 
as you know, I think I told you this, I'm from New York City. The city's so nice, they named it twice. The city's so pretty, they called it New York City. That's my place. Uh, and, is that? and so nice. Here's the thing I want to know. Here's a test for being a, a New Yorker. Does a native New Yorker eat hot dogs with onion or hot dogs with sauerkraut or both? Sauerkraut. I, eat, I, I just use mustard and sauerkraut myself personally. I never mess with onion in New yeah. York. Ketchup, did I, say, did I hear someone say that? Nah, no ketchup. Ketchup on French fries only. <laughs> Just so we, we, we had a guy you might know, Peter Van Norden. He's a native New Yorker. He loves the stage, especially when William Shakespeare wrote, wrote it. Uh, he was here, so that's for two weeks in a row. We've had somebody from New York, indeed. All right. Mm -hmm. Very well. well. First, question, first question, sir, is tell us about your plays. Oh, okay. My play is called The Pitch. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And it's based on my experiences working in telemarketing sales. Yes. Now, now, 20 years ago, I was um, an actor and I had stopped acting because I had had some ki kids. I was raising a family. So I, I took this job to, uh -huh. I thought, to make fast money. And it turned out there was nothing fast about sales except the pressure that they put on you. But during that job, I learned all these techniques that have really sort of helped me in life on how to influence people, how to kind of get what you want with bees, uh, honey, honey with bees. Yes. So my play is is based on that sales office. It's like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, kind of with that fast dialogue. And I have a very strong father-daughter subplot. So it's like office scenes, boom, father-daughter, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I got a great ending that no one will ever see coming. So fast turn. I'm not going to tell anybody. It's not going to leave this room. I'm not going to tell anybody anything. <laughs> All right, when did it. you write this play? Okay, I started writing this play 10 years ago. Woo! And I was carrying it around with me for about five years. And I and people say, what's in there? And I said, uh, I'm working on my play. I'm working on my play. But in reality, I had only written three scenes, 30% of it. And then the pandemic hit. And uh, the, my girlfriend, she just kind of inspired me. And then all of a sudden, I wrote 70% of it in four weeks. And then boom. So it's 10 years in the making, but inspiration was really in in four in four weeks. I really put the whole thing together. And now I've been fine-tuning it for the last three years. Three and years. Ready to go. What, what, what do you use? Your motivation, inspiration to write plays? What do you use? Well, to be honest, the reason I wrote this play was to, to give myself another part. See, I've been working a lot in film and I've been kind of getting typecast in these roles. I'm always the the aggressive stepdad, the aggressive cop, the aggressive lawyer, the SOB this, the SOB that. So I, I just felt like I was getting into a rut. So I wanted to do something where I could show a little bit more of who I am, you know, more, or do more of a three-dimensional character. So to be honest, acting is what motivated me to writing. I've always been a writer. I started out as a creative writing major in UCLA 30 years ago, but acting's my true love. But I use writing to get my acting going. Got you. Ladies and gentlemen, this man has 52 actor IMDb credits, three producer credits. Uh, he's, he did a couple of movies. One of them was called Love and Murder. That was his first IMDb movie credit. He also did a movie called The Guest House, uh, producer credit. So he's been around. He's been around. Definitely. Grass don't grow under your feet. <laughs> Thanks, I'm an oldie and, a, and I'm an aspiring goldie. That's what I call myself. <laughs> okay, oldie. Got one for you. What do you prefer, acting or writing? Uh, definitely acting. I mean, acting's performing. Writing is a lot harder for me. It's you're sitting, you're by yourself, you're, you're scribbling, you're 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 torturing yourself, going word for word, word for word. Acting is definitely much more of a. Um, it, 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 it's just a, a, it's much more adrenaline uh, uh, infused. You, you get much more of a uh, of uh, immediate feedback. It's just a be it's a better rush to be honest, and you're com and you're connecting to people. That's what I love about acting. Writing is solitary, very lonely. Very well, hard. Being a director, you ever thought about that? Uh, I never have, to be honest. Um, I've I've worked with actors here and there, but as far as um, the, directing a whole f a film or a play, no, I really haven't thought of it. I, I'm kind of my lane is writing and acting, gotcha. and now unfortunately I've been thrown in as a producer, yes. and that's that's the hardest mother effer of all is producing i mean there's so I, I didn't, I didn't hear what he said so i'm just going to go ahead and move on you know folks you know, he's not gonna, you know, hear that. i understand that you're also producing the play 
what's the experience of wearing that hat? Well, it, 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 it's, it, it's interesting because when I'm in rehearsal, I'm uh -huh. just supposed to be the actor. But not only am I the actor, but I'm the producer and the writer. So I've got so many things going at once. So it, it, it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's like I don't have enough time in the day. But on the other hand, it's, it's, the, the hats are getting muddled a little bit. So I have to be very careful to, to compartmentalize when I'm the actor, when I'm the writer, when I'm the producer. But right. the producer never stops. It's 24-7. By the way, here's my uh, little postcard I got going here, the pitch. All right. Give them the pitch, ladies and gentlemen. The I'm pitch. Playing the Mad Nanny Theater um, <laughs> this July July 1st to July 23rd. Saturdays at 7.30, Sundays at 3. Uh -huh. uh, this is 6760 Lexington right. Avenue. It's in Hollywood, California. Um, the website to get tickets is thestagecrafts.com, thestagecrafts.com. T H E S C A G E C R A F T S period dot com. It's an exciting play. It's it's got all these kind of sociopathic, colorful characters that you love to hate and you hate to love. That's <laughs> that's my play. That's who I, who I am. <laughs> Something that you can rub you the wrong way, but you love having me around. And, and, and in the end, you know, I have a big heart. And uh, that's what my play is about. My play is all about heart, heart and trust. And it's an exciting play. The pitch, please the come pitch. see it. The pitch gave you the pitch. And the pitch. We got a couple of uh, stills about uh, some of this cast that we have. Uh, it, it, look at this one. Huh? Recognize that one? Uh, yes. See, I actually did that. Um, I did the play last May, right during the pandemic. Right. And it uh -huh. showed, and um, that was uh, Sophie Reagan. She played the part of my daughter last time. Now I have uh, Auden Wiley. Wild, Wiley, Wiley, I mispronounced, and she's fantastic. I have a great, great cast. I'm bringing back some of the old, some of the, the original ones, infusing it with some great new talent. I got a new director, Louis Liberte, unbelievable. He's a New Yorker guy like me from Queens. Our high schools, we went right next to each other. I didn't even know that. Oh. He's a, he's what high school Coast did you go to? Um, uh, I went to Cardoza High. He okay. went to St. Francis Prep. So okay. I went to Louis. Aviation High. Oh, aviation, yeah, in Queens. Oh, yeah, I know that very well. Okay. Here's another click, picture for you. There's some other pop. Right. Those are that's what I call the bullpen. That's the sales guys. They're, they're the ones that are trying to teach me how to sell. And and I'm trying to dance with the devil, but still hold on to my morals. And you realize in sales that you, you gotta make short, you gotta make shortcuts. And and like in life, and in life you have to decide what is it worth it? How far will you go to make a buck, save yourself and family without kind of <laughs> going downhill that's my play that's Con Connor Colleen's in there um that was Anthony Marquez and Mike Pizzuto right now I've got Joe Lorenzo I've got um Omar Salazar I've got Phil Gibbs I've got Orion McCabe I've got a great cast and the brilliant William Warren who plays the IRS the villain of the play okay got one more to show you okay yes there they are that's them those are the two guys right there the gentleman on my right is William Warren he's an unbelievable stage actor uh, act, uh, he has his voice. It, it sounds like James Earl Jones. He's got power, charisma. And the guy to his left, my left, is Joe Lorenzo. Brilliant character, TV actor. He's another New York guy from uh, from Brooklyn. And he's been, he's currently being seen on Barry. He's been on a few episodes this last season. Brilliant actor. And the woman behind is Ronna Jones, who's coming back. She, she's the FBI agent slash uh, sales rep. So it's an unbelievable cast. And it's a fantastic play. Think Glenn Gary Gun Ross. That's my that's that's my style. That's your style. Got a quick question for you, sir. You yes, think sir. this is gonna go to become a movie? Well, I've had a lot of people ask me that. And and um the reason why I made it a play originally was because I wanted to perform it and I'm mm -hmm. and I wanted the, the the pure acting experience, which you get in theater. Film is great, but the acting experience isn't nearly the same because there's no there's no um, feedback right away. The only time in, in a film is, is when you see it at the end. Yes. But a, but a play like this, you're getting audience every day. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you in there. I'm going to come. I'll make it. I'll make it. it. <laughs> so um, I forgot. What was your question again? Uh, my question again was about be, 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 be being a director. Oh, uh, make a movie. Make, go into a movie. Make a movie. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely have already started to turn it into a screenplay. So um. And the reason for that is so many more people can see a film. That's the one problem with theater. You know, you have X amount of people can only come see it and then you can film it, but it's never quite the same. A film, a movie can last, you know, forever.
So I am I am in the process of of converting this into a into a film. All right. After the successful run that's coming up. <laughs> Gotta get up. My first July twenty third. <laughs> get a ticket or two. Hcrafts.com. Uh, have you ever been on Broadway? Uh, n I haven't worked on Broadway. No, I've done off off Broadway in theater, and I've been uh -huh. on there. I've been to many plays. I started going to plays when I was a little kid, but no, that, that's a dream to be yeah. able to work on Broadway. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the, the the ultimate goal always in a play is to get it there. But I got I got I got to walk before, crawl wow. before I walk, something like that. Baby steps, and now I'm taking a giant one here by producing this. Gotcha. Here's my favorite question: What excites you the most about this play? Um, being able to to collaborate with with ten other actors and my co-producer uh, Christine Blackburn and my director, just I feel like we're all like part of this sort of family that I'm working on an ensemble piece where I'm connecting with other great artists, and each day, each rehearsal, it's like a brand new experience. It's happened for the first time. So the excitement is is working with uh, with fellow artists and connecting in, into their lives and getting myself out of my own whatever you want to call it. Depression okay. at one point, or it, it, it's just getting out there, connecting. Got you. Being part of something else. Okay. Admissions twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. That's true. I online do, ticketing. Uh, um, pardon me. Online ticketing. Yes, yes, sir. Um, like I said, um, you can go on the website uh, www.thestagecrafts.com. T h c s t a g e c r a f t s dot com, or you can go on my website. Okay. Uh, Tom Alper, one word, T O M A A L P E R dot com. And right on the top, it'll say tickets. So it's 20 bucks. I'm probably going to have a promo code, We're knocking $5 off as well. So okay. I mean, $15 for this incredible entertainment. It's it's a steal. It's stealing. Yeah. And I pay money back guaranteed. If you do not like this play, call me up and I will refund your money, no questions asked. Estimating running time, 110 minutes. Uh, yeah, that's within intermission. So it, it, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, we got 10 minute intermissions. I'd say it's about an hour, 40, 42 minutes running time. Yes. Okay. Consumer advertiser, uh, ad ad advisory uh, suggestions for ages 13 to adult. Right. There is some profanity in there, but okay. it's, it, 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 it's mild. Okay. All right. And let's see, there's one more time. We want to see what the theater looks like. The Mad Nanny. Oh, yeah. It's brand new Just theater. Open, didn't it? I'm sorry, sir. That played this the theater just reopened, didn't it? Or just yes, opened? that is correct. It, it used to be the, the Lex for years, right? And, right. and, it, and it's it's got a brand new everything lobby, new seats, the lighting. It, it's beautiful. It's connected right next to the, to the McCadden. It's right there on Lexington, and right by Lexington and Highland. It's right in Hollywood, Hollywood, California. Exactly. Tom, we got to go, but would you hit us one more time, one more time with the pitch. The pitch <laughs> coming July first. 7 seven thirty on Saturdays, 3 p.m. Sundays. Glenn Gurg and Ross with an amazing father-daughter uh, subplot. You will love it. I promise. Money back guarantee. This is some of the most original, freshest dialogue you, you've seen in a long time. It's exciting. It's theater. Come on out. It's the weather's beautiful. It's air conditioned theater, very spacious. You'll have a great time. I promise you. And then come up to me. I'll buy you a beer afterwards. All right. <laughs> as long as it's a light beer. You know. Light beer. Greetings, Thank Tom, and thank you for stopping by today. We got to have you back again so we can hear some more about stage work that you do. That is marvelous stuff you're talking about. Please give my best to your publicist, Bill Sokoloff. Oh, Please. he's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Quite a, a guy. It's been a real quite honor. I, I love your podcast. I've been catching up on certain uh, um, past episodes. I oh, love yeah. the diversity and, and, your, and your, your, your style of, of of how you interview and how you make people feel so comfortable. It's a very gift. It's a great gift you have. Thank you. My pleasure to be your pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Ladies for having me. Tom Albert. Thank you. This is the Actors Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. Uh, roll it, Tony. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, for more information about the TAC Roku channel, please call us at 213-349-3941. That's 213-349-3941. Okay? Okay. Brother Tony. There was no 106 in Park. Um, there were a few of us on the air, a man by the name of Donnie Simpson hosting Video Soul. Remember that? That's my error. And so there were a few of us. There was Donnie Simpson and Sherry Carter and Ed Gordon and Angela Stripling and Robin Bremen. We were the first faces of the first black television network in American history. And I am very happy to be a part of the BET history. Ladies and gentlemen, as you heard me say earlier, today is the celebration of Juneteenth. And with that comes a dear friend of mine for many, I mean many years. This lady, you just saw her. With, I love the way she wears that white hat. Is a, she's an award-winning TV broadcast pioneer, a producer, and speaker at the United Nations Assembly, and on and on and on. The lady does a lot. Just You just saw her pick receiving the Rising Star Music Award from saying a good friend of us, John Sly Wilson. He's in a, a group. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one, the only April Sutton. <laughs> Greetings, April, and welcome hey, back again. Hey there. <laughs> How are you, Ron? I'm good. <laughs> Feeling good. When, when I know you're on there, uh, April was one of the first guests we had when we started uh, Actors' Choice some 360 episodes ago. Yeah, she was there with us. And uh, uh, thank you for being with us all along. I really appreciate it. All wow. Time. Well, let me just first say, Ron Brewington, you are one of singly the most premier broadcasters in the city of Los Angeles for decades. And I take pride in saying that because uh, when we talk about who were the ones in the front of the line in Hollywood interviewing all of the celebrities for radio back in the day, KJLH, and all of the other things that you've done in the city of Los Angeles and Hollywood is so remarkable. I'm so honored to be a part of this podcast. I am just saluting you, and I hope all of your listeners realize how much of a broadcast legend you are. So from one to another, I salute you as you say that you salute me, and that's real. Thank you. Thank you. You were born in what city, madam? A little town called Akron, Ohio. If anybody hey. has heard, heard of LeBron James or Howard Hewitt, um, those are my homeboys. We are all from Akron, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. Wow. And you went to school at Kent State? Yeah, I uh, received my bachelor's degree first, and then I continued on and received my master's degree in television journalism. When you were there, a guy by the name of Arsenio Hall was in that same school as you, wasn't he? Yeah, Arsenio Hall was there at Kent State and also Steve Harvey. Isn't that something? <laughs> wow. Yeah. As mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about this many, many times, the importance of education, what I call edumacation. You can't say enough. Yeah. You can't say enough. Well, you, yeah. For, well, for me, you know, that has played a big part. A lot of times people feel like when they go to college that they're really not going to use the classes, but I can tell you somewhere down the line, those classes will kick into gear and you'll realize that, well, you may not have taken some of those classes seriously, but you never know how at some point, somewhere along the line in your life, some of those classes will really be important. So uh, for me, it worked out. Wow. Now, one of the things that uh, we, that you look, that we have a picture of, you were a young lady, you had, you had a job, and there you were. Who, who is that lady that we're looking at right now? You're young then. Uh, this is, was it Geraldo? Oh, well, yeah. I, you know what? When I left BET, I worked for Geraldo Rivera. Uh -huh. um, they were looking for a West Coast person to cover the O.J. Simpson case. And I was already in Hollywood, the West Coast area. And so uh, Geraldo, I guess, Someone over there at CBS in New York had been watching me on BET, which is just you never know who's yeah. watching your work along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got the phone call, they let me know that they were searching for someone to do some interviews with celebrities or covering celebrity news. And at that time, Geraldo had a um, it was like a weekly segment called basically like entertainment news. So I happened to be on that segment every week. And a lot of times they would fly me into New York. I would be there right there on the set and uh, actually do celebrity news for that show. 
Oh, looks like you had a lot of fun doing it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You know, Geraldo was interesting. Uh, and, you know, he is known basically <clears throat> for his investigative reports, something yes. that I used to admire because uh, we've kind of gotten away from that. Yes. Yes, we have. Times have changed. Different times. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The next photo we have is you and a lady named Oprah Winfrey. Now, yes. Wow. Isn't that great? What a remarkable success story. Um, we at that photograph, we're at the Santa Barbara Racket Country Club. And uh, Oprah at that time was doing uh, an auction of some of her personal items. And I happened to be there at that. And I caught up with her there. And um, she's been a big inspiration for so many of us in television. And we've watched her career grow and expand to monumental heights. Totally remarkable what she's been able to achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. You, okay, the next one shows you with an award. You're getting an award. And you got number 56 on there in the background. Oh, that's the uh, Vanguard. Yeah, I received the Vanguard Award for my work in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very humbled uh, to say that I have received quite a few awards along the way throughout my career. It's always good to be recognized from your peers and people that uh, have watched your work on television. Um, it's something that you don't really expect, mm -hmm. but when it happens, you're, you're at least grateful. And in my case, I was just happy that my mother in particular lived long enough uh, to see many of the uh, accolades that I received. Mm -hmm. and I'm very grateful for that. Indeed. Indeed. The next photo that we have takes you to a place in downtown New York City, and it's called the United Nations. There you are standing in front of the United Nations. Tell us about your work that you've done with the United Nations, please. You know, I received my first invitation to the UN in 2005, and um, the sessions are very long, but you sit there, and within the course of those days that you're there, you literally are listening to over 100 world leaders speak at the podium. It is a life-changing experience, at least it was for me, uh, because at that point, I had already been in television for so many years, and to be at the UN and to um, be able to shake hands with President Erdogan of, of Turkey, to meet President J.K. Kikwete of Tanzania, Africa, uh, to meet Jacob Zuma, the president of South Africa, uh, to meet Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. I mean, to be able to meet His Majesty, the King of, of, of Morocco, uh, to meet the Sultan of Bahrain, uh, to meet the Crown Prince of Brunei. I mean, it's just a remarkable situation to be in the company of these people who are running countries. And so for me, um, it really inspired me to realize that there's so much work that needs to be done on this planet and that there are so many extraneous circumstances that are affecting people worldwide. And we sometimes get so lost in our own backyard, we do tend to forget that, you know, we are basically world citizens. And uh, and it's it's okay for us to branch out and learn more about what's happening in other places around the world. Yes. Now, you are known as an ambassador. Can you tell us about that, please? In 2011, uh, I was appointed by Ambassador Wimbo Odinga by way of Prime Minister Odinga out of Kenya, Africa, uh, as an ambassador of goodwill for the country. It's a permanent position. Uh, I was so, wow, so surprised what had happened. But I had been doing a lot of philanthropic work. I had partnered with, um, uh, you know, Adidas to try to get tennis shoes to villages yes. of, in East Africa. And then I partnered with Yale University to get medicine, uh, AIDS medicine, to Africa as well. And so my work caught the attention of, you know, the government officials, and they wanted to honor me, and they blessed me. I use the word blessed because it is a blessing uh, that they gave me an ambassadorship. Really, really, really uh, a remarkable appointment, and I um, am just so grateful for it. And I was so honored that I think you happened to be there uh, on the night of the ceremony. <laughs> you were actually there. 
and I'll never forget that day. Uh, we were there and to see this pet put put on you, if you will. Uh, yeah. Here you are an ambassador, but you earned it. You worked hard for it. It wasn't a give me. You did it on your own. So is that's beautiful to say. Beautiful to say and to know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another uh, uh, film to sell. Ah, uh, there you are again, holding a beautiful uh, legionnaire, same dress on that you had before. Now we got you standing up. But the next picture that we got, I like this one. It's even better. It's ah, uh, there you are with an Arabian. Uh, who is this gentleman? He looks beautiful, handsome, suave and debona. Who is this? Oh, uh, is that from uh, one of the members of the royal family? Yes, it is. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia. Yes, yes Arabia. that's one of the. Uh, yeah, that's Saudi Arabia. So as I mentioned, yes, I have been in the company of world leaders and members of royal families. Um, that has been the remarkable thing going to the U.N. You know, what's so interesting, Ron, is I had already interviewed so many people in Hollywood. And to many people, they would assume that that is just a height of a career. And yes, it is, because my college degree is in television. So for me to reach Hollywood and to work in Hollywood for all those years on BET and then on Geraldo, um, and even prior to that, being a news reporter in my hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, yes. uh, you know, I had really a really nice journey in television. But then when I got to the UN, wow, it just opened, opened up a whole nother world to understand that, you know, this, this planet is so vast and so big with so many circumstances and things happening and uh, international policy. And then, you know, we have global, global warming and we have phantom. We have people that are dying of diseases. I mean, <laughs> the list just kind of goes on and on and on. So um, being at the UN, it just opens you up to understanding what's happening in other places around this planet. And uh, we tend to get lost in our own country and which is okay, yes. but we do have to understand that we really are world citizens. Uh, can we go back to BET for just a second? The next one. Ah, uh, oh, there you are, BET. We're in a nice outfit. You stayed with BET because I remember when I was working for American Urban Radio Networks, and you and I would be at all the award shows, meeting all these people, and there would be you, there would be me, Aldo Kaya from Ebony Magazine. We were the only three African Americans out there. We really had a lot of fun, but at that time, but right. Uh, Tell, mm -hmm. us about what, what, tell us about how you, because you, you're the one who actually started BET here in Los Angeles. Is that correct? Absolutely. I was the first. Let me repeat. I was the first hired West Coast Hollywood on-air talent for Black Entertainment Television Network. Now, BET had already um, launched uh, Bobby Jones' The Gospel Show. That was back east. And Donnie Simpson doing Video Soul, that was back east. Uh, Sherry Carter was hosting with Donnie Simpson. And, of course, Angela Stripling was doing the jazz show. Ed Gordon was doing the news. Madeline Woods had her show. Robin Bremen was doing a show called Video LP. And the mayor was uh, doing a Rap City. So those were the first, basically, shows of BET. I was allegated to basically hire to specifically interview celebrities covering the Grammys, the Oscars, the People's Choice Awards, Soul Train Music Awards, covering all of the red carpet um, movie premieres. And you and I were doing press junkets almost every week. Right. I would run into you all the time because, yes. you know, it, there was so what just only three of us with color. Yeah. And when I started with BET, there were no black television reporters covering Hollywood. I mean, there was just no one. It was just me. And I would run into Mary Hart and Lisa Gibbons from Entertainment Tonight all the time. I would run into them. But, you know, I had to really uh, set the pace for the Hollywood coverage because there had not been anyone before me, and there was a lot weighing on my shoulder. And I took that position very serious. I was on BET for 10 years. And I can tell you, as you know, I interviewed literally everyone. I was there when uh, Michael Jackson received his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I was there, uh, you know, when many of the artists would receive their American Music Awards, whether it was Whitney Houston, whether, whether it was Bobby Brown at that time, who was big, I'll be sure. 
I just, remember when he won his first Grammy for uh, Best New Artist of the Year. Mm-hmm. I mean, the list just, I could just sit here and go on and on about uh, the people that I interviewed, but I especially enjoyed interviewing the legends, uh, the James Brown, Godfather of Soul, B.B. King. I enjoyed interviewing uh, uh, Aretha Franklin, Chaka Khan, Luther Vandross. I mean, the legends, people that had long lasting careers. Wow. You got to admire them. Indeed. We have time for one more event. You know, we have to talk about this. Ladies and gentlemen, the 15th annual Diplomat Diversity Gala. What you're seeing right there is information. Can you tell us about it, please? Yeah, you know, I started this event 15 years ago. This year is my 15th annual. It is um, an invitation only. I, I started it as a result of my going to the UN, and I felt like there's something that needs to happen here in the city of Los Angeles where people here that have a like mind interest in world affairs would be interested in understanding cultural diversity. And so I wanted to create an event where we can honor diplomats and ambassadors, and I've made that happen. Um, I had some naysayers in the beginning. They thought, oh, there's no way anybody would be interested in that in Los Angeles, but it has happened. And so I'm very happy to say that this year is marking my 15th event, and I'm very, very happy that we've had the support of people like you and people in the community that has rallied behind the initiative of understanding the importance of a platform like that. Indeed. Well, April, my sister, thank you so much for being with us today. You know that you can be on this program anytime you want, okay? May God bless you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And just congratulations to you on a wonderful podcast, keeping the platform real and giving opportunities for those of us who have a voice. Excellent. Excellent. I want to thank our sponsors, Harvey Bram and Photography as an Art, Ron Irwin's Lose Life, The Way to Lose Weight, Larry Buford's Books of the Future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm agent Carla Green, and veteran actor Rob Brownstein's Actor Training School and Actress Space. And much, much thanks to our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, actress, producer, writer, Raven Kelly, actor, producer, Tom Alpha, and award-winning TV broadcast pioneer, producer, and speaker at the United Nations Assembly, April 7th. Special thanks to our ever, ever, ever growing audience. We say be well. We'll see you next time. Thank you.